National Park Service logo, on-screen text, Gettysburg National Military Park virtual tour, auto tour number five, Virginia Memorial. We're standing now on Seminary Ridge, not far from auto tour stop five, the Virginia Memorial. Uh, more importantly though, we're standing near a spot called the Point of Woods. And it would be near this location that on July 3rd, 1863, Robert E. Lee would watch Pickett's Charge, the climactic moment of the battle. But to understand Pickett's Charge and that decision that Lee makes to launch it, you need to go back to the evening hours of July 2nd, 1863. You would think that at the end of the day, on July 2nd, Robert E. Lee would be discouraged. His assaults against the Union position had come up short, he had failed to destroy the Union Army, and he failed to drive it off Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill. On the contrary, by the end of the day on July 2nd, 1863, even though Robert E. Lee failed to destroy the Union Army, he was actually encouraged. Confederate assaults to the south gained a key artillery platform along the Emmitsburg Road near the Peach Orchard. Confederate assaults at Culp's Hill gained a little foothold, a little lodgment there. And Robert E. Lee believes that if he can simply continue that attack the next day, as Lee would write in his official report, the general plan remained unchanged. If he simply continues the attacks the next day, he believes he will be victorious. All he needs to do is ensure what Lee called a concert of action took place, that the Confederates to the south launched their attack at the same time as the Confederates to the north. Robert Lee would go to bed late at night on July 2nd, 1863, and wake up before dawn on July the 3rd. And the first sound Robert E. Lee hears is the sound of gunfire near Culp's Hill. And Lee assumes that that General Richard Ewell is launching that attack as he was told to do so. On the contrary, it's Union troops on Culp's Hill attacking the Confederates, but Lee doesn't know that. Lee, however, would turn his attention south towards Seminary Ridge and towards the position of James Longstreet, and Lee's concerned to see that Longstreet hasn't advanced. He doesn't hear the sound of gunfire. He doesn't see smoke rising above the tree line, and Robert E. Lee will ride south to confront James Longstreet. And he meets up with Longstreet somewhere near where we're standing now, not far from the point of woods. And Longstreet would argue that one, he didn't get the order to attack, and that two, he had already assaulted the Union position the previous day. And now, Union troops have been in position all night. They stacked up protection, breastworks, rock walls. How does Lee expect Longstreet to do better today on July 3rd with fewer men against an entrenched position? The sun has barely risen over the battlefield and already Robert E. Lee's plan for July 3rd is out the window. So Lee now has to adapt. He has to come up with a new plan. The assaults on Culp's Hill failed. Longstreet believes an assault to the south won't work. So what is Lee to do now? Well, Lee believes that if either end of the Union battle line is strong, there must be a weak point. There must be a weak spot. Lee believes that weak spot is at the center of the Union battle line on Cemetery Ridge. Lee will then formulate a plan to launch roughly 12,000 Confederate infantrymen across the field behind me towards the Union position on Cemetery Ridge. Now, 7,000 of these men will be men from AP Hills Corps, men from North Carolina, Mississippi, Tennessee. The other 6,000 will be men from George Pickett's division of Longstreet's Corps. These men are all from Virginia. They're the only troops on the battlefield that haven't seen any combat yet. One of the great things about being at the Gettysburg Battlefield is we can stand here at the Point of Woods, look across the field, and you can see almost the same thing today that these individuals saw in 1863. If 12,000 Confederate infantrymen make an assault across this field, well, they'll have almost no cover. There's very little concealment there. The field is crisscrossed with obstacles, and by that, I mean fences. If you're a Confederate soldier moving forward and you hit a fence line, you have to navigate it. You can go over it, through it, under it, but you've got to get past it. It's going to slow these men down. It's going to disrupt their formation. And furthermore, they're going up right against the very guns of the Union position on Cemetery Ridge, and James Longstreet doesn't think this plan will work. He doesn't believe it's a good idea. As Longstreet would later remember, he turned to Robert E. Lee and told Lee that, quote, he had been a soldier his whole life and served from the ranks on up, and that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. Longstreet would later say that it would take at least 30,000 men for this attack to work. Now, even though Longstreet is, is opposed to this attack, Robert E. Lee will place the entire responsibility for planning it, executing it, and launching it to James Longstreet, the man who wants to do it the least. And all throughout the morning hours of July 3rd, 1863, Infantry is moving into position, artillery is being rolled up, and everything hangs in the balance. Now at the Virginia Memorial, a rectangular stone monument. Gettysburg National Military Park is one of the best marked battlefields in the world. While over 1,300 monuments, markers, and plaques dot the landscape, marking and honoring where men fought and died July 1, 2, 3, 1863. 
The vast majority of these monuments and memorials honor the Union Army, or the Army of the Potomac, and Gettysburg is originally established as a Union Memorial Park, serving to commemorate the Union victory at Gettysburg. By 1917, however, the Virginia Memorial is added to the landscape. It marks close to where Robert E. Lee watched the climax of Pickett's Charge and is the first Confederate memorial on the battlefield. With a statue of Lee on top, uh, sculpted by the artist Frederick Seavers, often regarded as one of the best likenesses ever made of Robert E. Lee, it also honors the rank and file Virginians who fought and died on this battlefield.